Please. Please, I can't breathe. Please, man. By now, most people have seen this disturbing video. It shows George Floyd, an unarmed black man, dying at the hands of a Minnesota police officer. Within a week and a half, the four officers involved were fired and charged. Scenes like this playing out across the country. I can't watch no more of this. I'm sorry, but like, if I see one more name of a, another brother, Dad, like, I'm gonna lose it. Like, I'm really gonna lose my mind. Black Lives Matter, that's the, that's the message. In some places, those protests took a violent turn. The sun has gone down here in New York City, and there are clearly different groups that are out here facing off with police. If a city or a state refuses to take the actions that are necessary to defend the life and property of their residents, then I will deploy the United States military and quickly solve the problem for them. And an investigation now underway after an NYPD patrol car drove into a crowd behind a barricade. I am dispatching thousands and thousands of heavily armed soldiers, military personnel, and law enforcement officers to stop the rioting, looting, vandalism, assaults, and the wanton destruction of property. Some of which we saw right here in San Antonio. Until we realize that black lives are important, just as important as any other life, then no, no other lives matter. These are the sights and scenes in downtown San Antonio tonight. Sky 12 over that location. Uh, you can see several police officers in the streets after protesters had taken over the streets. But the protests and calls for justice have been largely peaceful, and those in power are now listening. I have a black son. I have a black father. I have a white face and a black voice, and you're going to hear it. I'm not going nowhere. We all make mistakes. There are going to be people out there who will, who will be with you who will make mistakes. There are going to be people on my side who well, maybe who will wear a uniform that might make mistakes, but let's forgive that and hold me accountable for it because I'm the mayor of this damn city and we're going to make change together, okay? The killing of George Floyd was the tipping point, but protests and tensions weren't born overnight. Thanks for joining us for KSAT Explains. I'm Myra Arthur. The topic of racial inequality is at the forefront in every corner of this country right now. It might make you feel uncomfortable or sad or angry or helpless. There are so many emotions at play. And when it comes to racial inequality, there are a lot of factors and history at play too. It is a complicated, nuanced topic, and we realize we won't be able to talk about every aspect of it in one show but we want to start somewhere. Throughout the show, we'll take a look at the history of protest culture, the history of the Black Lives Matter movement, how this historic moment is playing out right here in our city, and how this is a topic that is extraordinarily personal for so many people. The black man is feared. Um, no matter what he does, where he works, where he lives, all walks of life, he is Weird. And I've had experiences to where I've been riding through a neighborhood and been pulled over because I don't look like I belong there. A lot of us have been stopped for crazy reasons uh, along the way that didn't make any sense. Me and my dad and my mom have had conversations about some of the different things going on and everything you know, minorities have to deal with. Oh, you talk too articulately to be black. Or, oh, you're too smart to be black. So hearing people joke is, you know, I'm in a gang, or, you know, walking down the street and uh, people and white people not wanting to actually walk across by me, you know, they cross the street, you know, they don't actually want to walk right past where I am. And I think it's some of those subtle things that hurt the most. I had a gift card and the clerk looks at me and goes, is this good? And I go, 
is my card good? Why are you asking if my card was good? Well, I've been in a store where I'm being followed around by a salesperson. It's like, I'm not stealing. I'm, I have money. If I didn't, I wouldn't be in. Because sometimes you, you internalize it to a, in a sense where it's like you almost tell yourself that it was your fault or something, that you did something wrong or something like that. It's real. I mean, you know, um, people that don't have to experience that every day, they'll never understand. What is it about our skin color that makes people not trust us? I should not have to say, just because I'm black doesn't mean I don't have a brain. I'm not getting ready to rob you. Always was brought up that if anybody calls you a slang term, they call you boy, they call you <laughs> they call you anything derogatory, like you just be quiet because you already know their mindset. You can check all the boxes for being smart, um, being articulate with your words, not getting in trouble, not stirring a pot on things, and it, it didn't matter that night. It, all that mattered was that I was black in a car. What is so, what's so scary about our skin color? Why does everyone hate us because of our skin? We're going to be hearing more personal stories to give this issue some perspective throughout this entire show. But first, we want to take a look at how the protests have played out right here in our own city since the death of George Floyd on Memorial Day. The day after Floyd's death in police custody, protests began in Minneapolis. But it wasn't until that Saturday that we saw protesting in San Antonio. Thousands of people showed up at that first protest. And even though there was some chaos and some vandalism at the end of that night, the demonstrations were overwhelmingly peaceful. We know that this goes on all over the country. So this is our way of showing how we support that injustice is wrong. We are here to ensure the right of the folks who are here to protest. We're here to ensure that right uh, is enforced. Uh, we want them to exercise their First Amendment rights. Protests continued peacefully over the next couple of days, but then late on Tuesday, San Antonio police used projectiles that hit both protesters and members of the media. San Antonio police say they did what they had to do. Some members of the media were also hit with the projectiles. A reporter tweeting a question to the mayor asking if he was okay with this. He responded, no, I'm not. <laughs> This is new video just into the KSAT 12 newsroom from last night's unrest in San Antonio, leading law enforcement to react with pepper bombs and wooden projectiles. Since then, Police Chief William McManus says that going forward, the order for officers to use crowd dispersal weapons will come only from him. Some people have expressed surprise at the number of people who have participated in recent protests. But civil rights experts say there is a rich history of fighting for equality here in San Antonio. Now, the NAACP in San Antonio was chartered in 1918. So it's been around for over 100 years working on these issues to deal with equal rights, equal employment, equal educational opportunities. We're not where we need to be. Dr. Gregory Hudspeth has been the NAACP San Antonio chapter president since November 2018, but his involvement in local civil rights protests dates back decades. My early, earliest memory of the civil rights movement here in San Antonio, which I was involved in, was at, we had a grocery store here, Handy Andy, and the owner of Handy Andy stated that he would not permit a black person to count his money. So we established a picket line around Handy Andy. Hudspeth remembers the events leading up to the desegregation of downtown lunch counters back in 1960. Many of us who were in, living in San Antonio and attended school in San Antonio, we rode the bus to our various high schools, but we all met up in front of the Woolsworth building at a lunch counter. And we had one of the members of the NAACP to write a letter to the businesses downtown, the lunch counters downtown, asking them to integrate. When the NAACP gave business leaders an ultimatum to either face sit-in demonstrations or allow integration, many chose to integrate. These images from UTSA's special collections, which include stills from the San Antonio Express News and San Antonio Light, shows residents throughout the years involved in more demonstrations calling for equality. 
Here's a look at NAACP members awaiting President John F. Kennedy at the airport back in 1963. This snapshot shows local workers joining the Rio Grande Valley Farm Workers March to Austin when it stopped here in San Antonio in 1966. Fast forward to today. San Antonio's Martin Luther King Jr. Day March is billed as one of the largest in the entire country. And the Cesar E. Chavez March for Justice has been going on for more than two decades. It was only canceled this year because of the pandemic. But despite this history, many were still surprised at the turnout of the protests in the wake of George Floyd's death. San Antonio doesn't have the, the greatest protest history, but San Antonio has a great civil rights history. And that civil rights history uh, spans across the brown community, the Hispanic community. There's been many times when civil rights activists from the Hispanic community and from the black community have joined hands. And as far as the recent protests, experts say that turnout is a sign things are changing in San Antonio. The other day I noticed five or six different rallies going on in different parts of the city where some of them were small as 50 and somewhere as large as 500. That is a big difference and I think that makes it a game changer. You can't compare San Antonio's past protest culture with what we have now. There's no comparison, it's much greater. It's a phrase that's been chanted across the world following the death of George Floyd, Black Lives Matter. The origin of those words dates back to 2013, following the death of a black 17-year-old from Florida. RJ Marquez details the journey of the Black Lives Matter movement since the death of Trayvon Martin. Black people, I love you, I love us, our lives matter, Black Lives Matter. This was the phrase posted on Facebook by activist Alicia Garza back in July of 2013. The post was in response to the acquittal of George Zimmerman, the man who shot and killed Trayvon Martin. Patrice Cullors added a hashtag to the phrase and fellow activist Opal Tometi shared it online and it spread across social media. These three women are the co-founders of the Black Lives Matter organization. A lot of times people are totally uh, not paying attention that the three people that created that whole movement happened to be females. They did it to say, America, wake up. This is happening. The phrase received national attention in the summer of 2014 when demonstrators started to protest in the streets after the deaths of two black men at the hands of police officers, Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, and Eric Garner in New York City. Since then, Black Lives Matter activists have protested in several states across the country, including Texas. The organization has 16 chapters across the U.S. and Canada, and they operate without a central hierarchy. The co-founders wanted to create a network to provide activists with a shared set of principles and goals. Those goals include stopping police brutality against black people, ending excessive policing in black neighborhoods, and making sure law enforcement officers are held accountable. The organization is not behind every Black Lives Matter protest. The phrase has been adopted by many activists. The thing I've noticed the most about all of these protests is that there's, there's a lot of young people out there. There's a lot of, you know, 20 year olds. There's a lot of 25 year olds. There, it's not just all black people. It's Hispanics, it's whites, it's Vietnam vets, it's 80 year old women, it's little, you know, young adults. They feel strongly about what has been happening and, you know, they want to want to do something about it. Over the years, Black Lives Matter has had its share of opponents, with some saying the organization relies too much on social media and others accusing them of placing a target on police officers. And then, of course, there are those who take issue with the phrase itself. But Black Lives Matter activists say they are not suggesting that black lives should be or are more important than all other lives. Instead, it's simply pointing out that black people's lives are relatively undervalued in the U.S. and more likely to be ended by police. San Antonio activist Tristan Patton compares Black Lives Matter to a house that's on fire in a row of homes. We need to focus on the fire that's been set. We need to focus on the fires that have been set within our community. Black Lives Matter movement means that there's a voice on the street yelling for that firefighter, yelling for those firefighters to come and put this house out first. Put the water on, on us. Like, help us put out this fire. Help us matter. Help us matter the same way that everyone else matters. We just want to matter. And more Americans are beginning to approve of the message. The majority of Americans now are saying that 
they know that uh, black people have more of a problem with police abuse than anyone else. They support uh, the idea that black lives do matter. A recent civics poll found that support for the Black Lives Matter movement jumped from 42 to 53 percent in the span of two months. Everyone agrees that all lives matter. But when we're talking about the, the depth of discrimination against African Americans, it's, their, their lives never ever mattered. And so more and more people have come to understand that concept as opposed to, you know, trying to get away with some fast talk uh, about all lives matter. I mean, yeah, all lives do matter. But we're talking about who is the principal target in this society, and white supremacy makes that possible by targeting people whose skin color is different. Black Lives Matter! Police accountability is a huge part of this conversation, and it's something the case at 12 defenders covered extensively in a special called Broken Blue. There was a lot to talk about here, but this is the crux of what they found. Under the current contract between the city of San Antonio and the police union, there are measures in place that protect officers accused of misconduct. That makes reform difficult among the protections. When an officer is accused of wrongdoing that isn't a criminal matter, internal affairs must give the accused officer 48 hours notice before any interview can take place. And during that 48 hour window, before the accused officer speaks to investigators, they are allowed to review all of the evidence in the investigation. There's also a brief statute of limitations. Police administrators have six months to administer any discipline against an accused officer. In criminal cases, the clock starts when the department becomes aware of the charge. In civil matters, administrators can only act within 180 days of when the incident took place. Here in San Antonio, since 2010, roughly two thirds of fired officers got reinstated after arbitration. It's a problem that SAPD Chief William McManus recognizes. He's repeatedly talked about the need to look at collective bargaining agreements that are in place that oftentimes protect the officers accused of misconduct. Uh, state laws and, and collective bargaining agreements actually contribute to to the misconduct. And, um, you know, when when um, officers who are terminated or, or actually disciplined in any way uh, in, in, by ways of by way of a term a uh, suspension they have the right to um, call for an independent uh, for, for an arbitrator to review the case so um, as far as I'm concerned if um, when consequences for misconduct are not certain and final which means you know this is going to happen to you if you do this if you do X, Y, or Z, and you know that if you do it and this happens to you, the outcome is gonna be final. There's gonna be no arbitrator to give you your job back. So um, when that doesn't happen, we are stuck with bad police officers. The current San Antonio police contract expires September 30th of 2021. It's been more than six years since Marquise Jones was shot and killed by a San Antonio police officer. Since that moment, Jones' family has fought for justice and to keep his memory alive. RJ Marquez spoke with Jones' aunt about the pain her family has carried and how these new protests have renewed their fight. Marquise Jones was 23 years old when he was killed. He was a loving kid. He was a clown of the family, so... Um the dancers, he was a jokester. He was just an all, all around fun kid and as an adult also. Debbie Bush says her nephew played basketball at Stevens High School where he graduated from, but his passion was music. He loved basketball, he was a basketball player. And then he got into wanting to be a rapper. <laughs> Yeah. as all kids at that time wanted to do, wanted to be. That's what he was studying at Northwest Vista College at the time of his death. Jones was shot in February of 2014 by off-duty SAPD officer Robert Encina. He was a passenger in a car that was involved in a fender bender in the drive through of Achachos on the northeast side. Encina was working security at the restaurant and tried to detain the driver when he said Jones got out of the car and displayed a gun. Encina shot Jones, claiming self-defense. Jones tried to run away but collapsed and died. A gun was found at the scene, but police never established if it was Jones's weapon. An internal investigation determined that Encina was justified in his use of force, and a Bear County jury voted not to indict him. Bush says her nephew was not without his faults, but he didn't deserve to die. He kind of lost his footing. 
Um, but then when his daughter was born, um, he decided that he needed to straighten up um, and get his life right um, to be there for her. Um, and unfortunately, his life was cut short when she was only three months old. Jones's daughter is now six years old. With only pictures and videos left to remember him by, she often asks about her dad. She's almost like a replica because she turned her face a certain kind of way or she fixed her mouth and she looks just like him, you know. So um, as she's getting older, she's starting to understand um, what happened. We just let her know her daddy loved her very much. In 2017, Jones's family filed a wrongful death lawsuit, but a jury cleared the city of San Antonio and Encina. Bush says it's taken a toll on their family, but the killing of George Floyd renewed their calls for justice for her nephew and two other black men recently killed by police officers in San Antonio, Charles Roundtree and Anthony Scott. I lost some momentum um, over the last two, maybe two years, because it, it just got hard and, and it just got tedious and no one was listening. Um, but with what's going on in our country today, it's picked up, this case has picked up a lot of momentum. Bush says while this new momentum has given her family hope that one day the case will be reopened, she knows her family will never be whole again. And I wish he was here so he could see how beautiful his daughter and how smart she is and how much he is like him. All of us have done things in our lives that we, we regret. There is no way we can fix it. I wish he was here. You don't know the pain we feel. Bear County District Attorney Joe Gonzalez says he does not have plans to reopen the cases of Marquise Jones, Charles Roundtree, or Anthony Scott. The struggle for racial justice is nothing new, but a lot of people we've talked to say that this moment feels different. We ask them why. And it dawned on me that from all of the protests from like 1954 to the present, which had been some of the major ones, I was alive. So all of these protests that have occurred, they've occurred during different time periods in my life. Carla Broadus has been alive to witness major historic events in America's civil rights history. Brown versus Board of Education, that impacted me and my education. The Emmett Till, protest. I was a student. 1957, the Little Rock Nine. I was a student. Go all the way forward to Vietnam. I was a college student. I was a high school and college student. As a child, Dr. Martin Luther King's church was one block from my family's church in Atlanta. And she says this particular moment in history feels familiar. As I was living those moments, I'm feeling the same. And I haven't felt, I'll have to be honest, I haven't felt this angry about everything that's going on in our society right now toward African Americans. She's not alone. So what we're watching now and what we're witnessing, we're witnessing a change. The times are changing and the world's watching and there's a lot of pressure being placed on the United States to do something differently than they've done in the past. We're looking at a long, long history of pain, of people being abused, and then just like anything else, there's a last straw. This was the straw that broke the camel's back, if you want to say it that way. We, we had Breonna Taylor, we had Ahmaud, we had George Floyd. The fact that George Floyd was killed in the middle of a global pandemic has been repeatedly pointed to as a possible factor that made this moment a tipping point. Everybody's been also kept in the house because of the coronavirus. People that maybe wouldn't normally be watching all the news channels all day long are at home doing so. And I've heard people say this over and over again. If I had been at work, I might not have saw that knee to the neck. It's historic. It's almost a perfect storm where we, I think we can see the opportunities to change uh, this, this system of, 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 of policing uh, in this country. So now the world is actually seeing what is happening to the black community with police. 
Not only are more people tuned into the news at this time, but data shows that racial and ethnic minority groups are being disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Here in San Antonio, as of June 14th, Black San Antonians made up 19.3% of deaths. They make up just 7% of our total population. This backs up a pattern being seen nationwide. An April analysis by the Associated Press shows nearly a third of those who have died from COVID-19 complications in the U.S. are black. I think some of what you see happening now is a result of that. You look at also the coronavirus in which African-Americans suffer at a greater portion than any other population. There's a lot of pain and anger that people are dealing with right now, but there also seems to be some hope. It seems uh, to me that you have a concerted effort to keep it going, that there's a concerted effort not to give up. So that obviously generates the kind of hope that people need to feel that something can actually be changed. You know, you have all these people who, you know, are out here protesting and demanding for change. And I think that's the biggest thing you can hope for that comes from the protests, you know, that people in charge, lawmakers, you know, can sit down and say, okay, this is a problem across the board. You know, there's all these people, not just in San Antonio, but across the nation who feel this way. And how can we start to implement things and change things to kind of fix our broken system? When it comes to policing, the push for change is raw and real for many across America right now. So now the question becomes, what could that change look like? It all depends on your idea of a solution. Three movements have made their way to the forefront. The eight can't wait campaign, defunding police and abolishing police. Just as it sounds, abolishing police means getting rid of police departments and coming up with a different way to protect and serve. The activist group Critical Resistance, a group outspoken against many common policing tactics, describes the move as a push to, quote, dismantle the systems of policing and says it, quote, works to create viable alternatives in our communities, end quote. In Minneapolis, where George Floyd was killed, the city council voted to disband its police force. The Associated Press reports that would not be a first. According to the AP, it happened in Camden, New Jersey in 2012 when crime was surging. That police department was replaced with a new force that covered the local county. The AP has also reported that in 2000, the city of Compton, California made a similar move. Then there's the effort to defund the police. This push is a bit murkier, with some supporters urging city leaders to strip away all funds from departments, effectively getting rid of them. But then there are those who want money to be reallocated to other services so that the authority of police doesn't have as wide a reach. Listen to SAPD Chief William McManus explain his understanding. I've read a lot of different uh, um, iterations of defunding the police. The one I read uh, most recently was that uh, things that police are doing that uh, are not typically uh, responsibilities of law enforcement, such as dealing with the mentally ill, dealing with the homeless. I think the idea that that was expressed in the article I just read was that the money that funds the police to deal with those those particular areas would be directed to other more appropriate agencies to deal with. The eight can't wait campaign is focused on specific reforms. It urges police departments to adopt or ban eight tactics banning chokeholds and strangleholds, requiring de-escalation and warnings before an officer shoots, requiring an officer to use all other options before resorting to deadly force, mandating an officer intervene if another officer is using excessive force, ban shooting at moving cars, create a force continuum that restricts the most severe use of force and creates clear policies on each type of police weapon and tactic and require comprehensive reporting every time an officer uses force. According to 8 San Antonio has four of these tactics in place. But Chief McManus has said his department has all eight in place, but the discrepancy may be in the exact wording used in SAPD's policies. McManus has signaled he's willing to make changes to make those policies fall in line with the eight can't wait campaign. Throughout the recent unrest in America, we've seen some protesters represent themselves as being affiliated with certain movements. There's Antifa, which the president has spoken out strongly against and said he wants to designate as a terrorist group. And then there's Boogaloo, a lesser known movement that's shown up in San Antonio recently. So who are they and what do they stand for? 
let's start with Antifa. That stands for anti-fascists. Antifa protests what they view as far right wing ideas, often using aggression. Their supporters tend to come from the far left and have seemed more prominent after the election of President Donald Trump. Antifa made headlines in 2017 for taking demonstrators head on in Charlottesville, Virginia at a white supremacist rally. Some Antifa counter protests have been violent. According to the Anti-Defamation League, Antifa believes the Nazi party could have been squashed if people had fought them more aggressively in the streets back in the 1920s and 30s. Then there's Boogaloo, considered heavily armed anti-government extremists who side with the far right. First, let's talk about that name. According to the Associated Press, it comes from a 1984 movie called Break in Two Electric Boogaloo, a sequel movie about breakdancing. Boogaloo is actually a type of Latin music, but for those who support this movement, it's become slang to refer to a bad sequel. And the sequel many in the Boogaloo movement are referring to is a second American Civil War. Then there's the Boogaloo Boys, a subgroup that recently showed up wearing their signature Hawaiian shirts and toting guns in downtown San Antonio. They said they were ready to defend the Alamo during a demonstration to support George Floyd. That's after the Cenotaph in Alamo Plaza had been vandalized by graffiti. Both movements appear to be fluid, loosely organized. Imagine a Facebook group. Most don't have membership requirements, and all you have to do is like and follow along. While their ideals differ, these movements seem to gain support the same way, online, when someone hears a message they like and want to follow. A local man says he was a college student in the early 2000s when he had an encounter with a police officer that quickly became very violent. Charles Davis is now the UTSA Assistant Athletics Director of Creative Services and recently shared his story publicly with San Antonio Magazine for the first time. He also talked to us about why he decided now was the time to come forward. Davis says it all started when he was pulled over while driving back to campus from Wimberley. I asked the officer, you know, what am I being pulled over for? Um, and he tells me I fit the description of a burglar in the area. I'm, I'm asking, what does the guy look like? I want that answer. You know, what does he look like? And he finally tells me, he's like, he looks like you. You know, he looks like a Once I heard those words, I was like, oh, this isn't going to be a good situation for me. He had to get out of the car. I may have taken two steps out of my car before he had already grabbed me and slammed my face into my the hood of my car, broke my glasses. I end up, you know, just trying to stay as quiet as I can. Talking to me, he's hit me already two or three times with this nightstick. I have a couple of my teeth have already flown out. And then I see another cop car start to drive up. The one that hit me, it's basically tells the guy like, oh, I got this, you know, and then he drives off and leaves. But before that, when the officer was walking up, I remember, like, I'll never forget that feeling. Like, he took his gun out of his holster, shoved it in my ribs, and he told me, when that guy was walking up, he told me, if you say the word about any of this, I'm going to the address on your driver's license and I'm killing everybody there. Then when I'm done with him, I'm coming back after you. He hit me couple more times to the point where now I've, I'm passed out unconscious in the ditch. I woke up maybe like an hour and a half later. My car has been ransacked. I go in my car, I grab a bag out of my car, put my teeth in it. I start the process of slowly driving to the hospital because I can't see. My glasses are broken. I was terrified I was gonna get pulled over again. I walk into the emergency room, I just tell them that I got uh, in a car accident. Basically, they patched me up, asked me if I want to stay overnight, I tell them no, and I go back, back to my dorm room, and I just locked myself in my dorm room and just cried. I didn't tell anybody. I literally was in my room for about a week. To this day, I mean, I have panic attacks when I see or hear lights. If I get pulled over, some people could say I am could be completely justified by hating law enforcement or something like that, but I'll, I'll never think that way. You know, I, I know that this wasn't an issue of just law enforcement as a whole. This was an issue of an individual who felt like he was above the law and could do what he wanted 
based on hatred of a race. With so many people clearly hurting right now, some people are asking themselves how they can help. RJ tells us about some effective ways to show support. Marcus Baskerville says he was disappointed he couldn't participate in citywide demonstrations to protest police brutality in the wake of George Floyd's death. But as the co-owner of Weathered Souls Brewery, he knew he could find another way to help. You know, I was trying to figure out a way as a black business owner how I can put my best foot forward and assist with the message and the mission of equality. Baskerville started the Black is Beautiful campaign. Breweries from around the country and world have now signed on to brew Baskerville's recipe and share his message. Well, the whole Black is Beautiful platform is to highlight, you know, the injustices and inequalities of people of color and to basically call upon the brewing industry, which has been great at supporting other causes. Baskerville is one of countless people now looking for ways to support a national movement. In big and small cities alike, protesters have hit the streets to speak out on police reform, systemic racism and inequalities. Others are donating to organizations such as Black Lives Matter or community-based programs like the YMCA that provides emergency services for communities in need. And if you can't donate, there are other ways you can make sure your voice is heard. We want people to understand how important this election is, the, the 2020 election. And it's not just important with regards to the presidential election, because that is very important. But the state representatives and state senators and congressional seats are of equal importance. And many people point to education as a major factor. Local activist Tristan Patton says his great-grandfather survived the Tulsa race riots, a historic event he says is rarely discussed in U.S. history classes. You're going to start digging things up that are harsh. But understand, when, when you take the time to understand those, those moments, then you start to see oppression as a whole, from a whole different angle, silence suffocates us, um, suffocates our culture, suffocates our history, suffocates our past, just as much as a need to the neck. As with any issue, the first step towards change is conversation. Having people live with um, unity of, of one another starts with taking the time to have dialogue with other people that don't look like me, don't look like you. You know, you take the time to have a healthy dialogue with people just to understand, just to begin to understand who they are. My name is Daphne Gray. My name is Alexis Page. My name is Dominic Lawrence. My name is Devin Clark. My name is Kevin Heisen. My name is Katrina Weber, and I've, uh, I'm a reporter, I think. <laughs> no, I'm a TV news reporter. I've been in news since 1988. I can't remember when I realized it, but it's definitely been a part of my life, most of my life. I know that I get profiled. I grew up as a little, little kid from like, I don't know, age zero to five-ish in Detroit, and then I moved to El Paso, and that's where I really grew up. But there, you know, the amount of black people there are there is not as much <laughs> as um, Hispanic people, specifically Mexicans. And that's about when I realized that, you know, things could be different. When I moved to college, I got pulled over for supposedly bringing drugs from Dallas to college. I was moving out there, I had my clothes in the backseat, and I sat in the squad car for an hour and a half. My brother and I, we was uh, driving on the east side, and uh, the cops pulled us over, and they called him and they get out the car. One of the officers tell me, hey, I will give you a chance. If you run and you get away, I'll let you go. But if I catch you, you're going to jail. There was a lot of like stereotypes placed on me that I didn't understand as a kid. And I was like, I don't understand, not all people are like that. But I realized, oh, these are what these people think that all black people are like. When I go work out, my dad's scared if I go running. When I get off late at night, my mom's scared I'm not gonna make it home. My girlfriend doesn't know if I'm gonna be home all the time. It's hard being black in America at this point here. Um, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, <clears throat> it's very scary. I have a 19 year old son and uh, 29 year old son and it worries me a lot with them being out there 19 year old son you know he he's young and he drives around a lot and hangs out with his friends and his girlfriend and it scares me you know 
will he come home that night? When I used to be a photographer, I was told that there's certain places I shouldn't go film at night because I shouldn't go alone. And this is in West Texas. I've had my fair share of people saying that I talk too black or I talk too white, you know. Uh, I had people questioning things about my hair or my stature, things like that, you know, that I, I don't think, you know, white people have to deal with uh, in the news business. But I remember, like, trying to set up my camera, and then I hear what sounds like a child's voice uh, shout out the N-word from the window, and I just couldn't believe it. I could say in San Antonio I haven't felt it as much. I almost feel like there's sort of, um, sort of a buffer as a news person that I'm put into a different category when I'm at work. People treat me differently. I think now more than ever, it's evident that it's important to have diversity in the newsroom. You can only empathize so much. Sometimes you need people who understand. I think that as a black woman, I bring a different uh, view of the world. Having a diverse newsroom, it, it forms a conversation inside of the newsroom, more education inside the newsroom. I think it helps with people in terms of empathy because you have that kind of attachment to the community. It doesn't even have to be a racial thing. It can be an economic status. It can be an abled body thing. It could be people who've had some kind of disadvantage in their life. It is best that those people can tell sometimes the best stories. When we go into these communities and, and people see, oh my God, Here's a, a black woman who's reporting. Here's a black woman who's on the desk. That little girl or that little boy or, you know, somebody of a different race can see themselves do things like that. It's definitely not possible for me to separate my identity from my professional self. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's possible to completely separate yourself from who you are. It's what makes you best for the job. Being authentic in that nature also builds trust. My identity is what makes me ask a certain question to somebody at any scene. It might be easier for you to understand someone because of something in your personal life. You know, one reason because being black really helps being a journalist right now is I can make sure we report the stories of these protests, of these riots um, in the best way that is just straight facts because I don't want, you know, people to misconstrue the message that's trying to go through as a black person and also as a journalist. It's almost as if I have two people, I have me I'm, I'm a black woman down to my DNA. This is how I am regardless of what job I do uh, and, you know, who I hang out with, where I go to church. I'm a black woman at the end of the day and at the beginning of the day. Um, and so as that person, it affects me because I can see, you know, when I see those people, in the situation they're in, I can imagine myself, I can imagine my nieces or nephews, I can imagine my cousins or brothers or sisters being the victims in those situations. When we first see those videos, you, fit, you picture or you feel a sense of sadness, first and foremost, because you look at the, the video and I can only think to myself, like, what if, that, what if that was my dad, you know, all the way in Arkansas? I definitely think it takes a toll on me as a black man personally because it's not just inhumane, it's the reason behind the lack of compassion and the lack of love. It's just kind of um, heartbreaking to see that some of the issues that my grandmother told me about that she dealt with growing up in the 20s in the South are still rampant today. You get a sense of anger because you want to step in and help, but you just feel completely helpless because the deed is done. You deal with that thought in the back of your head, but then you're also dealing with so many people sharing this video with their own takes on it, and then so many people with so many hateful, you know, blatant racist comments. So it's, it hurts. It's a hurting thing. As the journalist, though, when I'm dealing with a story like that and a lot of the stuff we've been covering, I have to put my journalism hat on. I have to be as unbiased as possible and to be able to tell the stories and be as fair as possible. It's, it's not easy to do, but it's something that I'm committed to do. When you know this is the hot topic of the newsroom, you're walking on eggshells in a way because you're afraid that, you know, your coworkers could be your best friend, could not be your best friend, but, you know, coworkers who are not people of color may make comments or statements that uh, they don't know is offensive, but could be very offensive to you and you don't really know how to approach that. So having that weight and then going home with it and 
going back to social media and all of that's just circulating constantly in your mind, anger, sadness, frustration, a roller coaster of all these dark emotions, it puts you in a very black hole in a, a dark space with what's going on in the world today. I'm hurting. It hurts me constantly watching these videos and out of the 19 years that I've been here, this is the first time it really have hit me this hard. I've seen this video over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Again, that, you know, I actually had to take some time off myself um, just to get myself together. And um, right now I'm uh, seeking counseling um, to get help. And I've never felt this bad, this horrible. These are not issues that people are trying to have. People don't want to have to fight and get tear gassed and march and be annoying to some. Um, we have to understand why these issues persist. If someone's never been discriminated against, I don't expect them to understand discrimination. But if you sit there, if you, if you sit down with them and actually bring out the history books and talk to them about how we got here to this point, then I think that can go a long way. I think it's just time for us to unite and you know let the others know that hey, come and talk to us. Let us, you know, let us explain to you why we're hurting. Systemic racism is the reason for it, but it's not a black issue. It's a humanitarian issue. I, I think this is probably the first time in a while since these kind of issues have been happening that I can see a little light at the tunnel, and it's because this time around I've seen people speak up. Our ancestors, they put up a good fight, and now we have to finish this fight. I was caught off guard, and my breath was taken away from me because literally I'm standing among uh, all these people of different races, and I look down and I look back up, and all these people that were gathered around uh, the memorial they had set up at Travis Park were laying flat on the ground on this wet grass. It just rained, so they were laying flat on the ground, and I was like, oh, okay. And then they started chanting, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, for nine straight minutes. You know, the time that uh, that police officer, or that former police officer, had his knee on George Floyd's neck, and what George Floyd was saying, you know, screaming for his life. And I tell you, it echoed downtown, and that right there, that's the way you do it. I think being firm but peaceful uh, gets the message across louder and more powerful than anything you could possibly do. It made me feel good. Uh, it made me, you know, proud to be a black man here in San Antonio, in America. We've been, you know, locked up, put away, whatever it may be, but to see the protests going on. That was a huge thing for me. It made me feel good. It made me proud to be a black man. Now seems like the time where we can get together and, and have these conversations, these dialogues, and try to affect some change. I don't know what the answer is. I know that you know racism is a thing that has been with this country since its inception, so I don't really know how we uproot this. Uh, but this is definitely the time to try to put our heads together and have some conversations. A major period in the history of racial inequality in this country is, of course, the time of slavery. Communities across the U.S. celebrate Juneteenth on June 19th every year. It's considered the oldest known celebration commemorating the end of slavery in the United States. But some say that while it is a day to celebrate, it's also a day marked by sadness. In September 1862, President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, an executive order declaring all slaves in the U.S. be freed, effective January 1st, 1863. But it took two and a half years before enslaved people in Texas were told the news. It all started because Unfortunately, the slaves here in Texas did not know that uh, they had been freed. On June 19, 1865, Union soldiers arrived in Galveston to announce the end of the war and to enforce President Lincoln's executive order. The first Juneteenth celebration can be traced back to June 19, one year later. Juneteenth is a period of time in which uh, we come together in order to celebrate African-Americans' freedom and independence, 
of freedom. In 1980, Texas became the first state to recognize Juneteenth as an official state holiday. Texas would later be joined by 46 other states and Washington, D.C. And while it's a day of celebration, civil rights experts say it's important to note that the holiday's history is complicated because for so many, liberation took even longer. It was a, a, a day of hope, but was also a day of despair because even after that it was announced, uh, slave owners in Texas refused to let people leave the plantation. In some cases, those who said, I'm free now and I'm going to leave, were shot in the back as they were leaving the plantation. Free freedom was never truly uh, enforced. Throughout this show, we've heard a lot of personal stories about lived experiences, and we want to end this episode with this one. Jay Sibley, a local high school student, 15 years old, who recently penned an essay on KSAT.com reflecting on what he's learned watching what's going on in the world around him. Started with uh, Ahmaud Arbery, and then, you know, of course, the story of Breonna Taylor was mentioned, and Christian Cooper, and then, you yeah, the incident with George Floyd, and it was just, it was all tough to deal with. I wanted to be able to share how different you know, what minorities face growing up. There's a phrase we use in my house. You have to work twice as hard to get half of what they have. It sums up the unfair reality that minorities have to work harder than others to reach the same heights. It's a truth minorities in America have to wake up ready to face every day. Like most Americans, I hold the we the people at the beginning of the Constitution with reverence. The iconic phrase is something I used to view with awe when I was younger. I believe America is the utopia that its founders wrote about. As I've gotten older and now at 15, some of the naivety has faded away. I can view this phrase with clearer eyes. These unalienable rights spoken of in the Constitution really only applied as long as you wielded some sort of influence. The idea that all men were created equal held true as long as your skin color wasn't too dark. Then you were only three-fifths of a person. We the people wasn't something that encompassed the entirety of the American population, but I hope that at some point it will. What I've learned during this time is that I'm committed to work twice as hard, despite the challenges, starting with using my voice and knowledge in order to start to change the inequity and injustice still alive and well around me. My hope is that while I do this work, others will do the work of listening, learning, and getting to know people that are different from them. Then we can all learn that it's a lot harder to hate up close.